Welcome to Sporting Goals, the BTEC Sport and Exercise Science webinar series, supporting educators and learners to maximize the value of their BTEC qualification during and beyond study. In this episode, episode three, we will be focusing on a qualification, the level three sport and exercise science qualification. We will be covering detail and information around understanding for this qualification, a practitioner's perspective from a course leader within a center, and we'll also be speaking to bases. This webinar will be useful for both viewing and listening for those considering in center delivering this qualification, those that are currently delivering this qualification, those that are given advice and guidance for learners progressing onto this qualification. There will be value for applicants and learners on the program. Okay, so we have a bit of a bumper edition today, uh, which includes Sean, who's a course lead at Bath College, Sue Watson, who was involved at BASES. But first of all, we're gonna to speak to Jenny Stafford-Brown. And Jenny Stafford-Brown is the Senior Standards Verifier and Chief Examiner on this qualification. So how are you, Jenny? Hi, Gareth, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very good, uh, really nice to have you here. Um, this webinar has come about really from speaking to a number of different centres, those that are either delivering this qualification and telling me about all their good practice and the real value that they see for their learners, but also those centres that maybe have not considered this qualification yet. And really just to share with them the real value that there is in terms of this, this pathway for them. So that's why I've asked you along. But I think before we get into that, it'd be really interesting to know how you ended up in the world of sport and, and what your interest is in and around that. Okay, it's a good question. So uh, essentially, I've mainly been interested in the exercise side of um, um, sports. So sport and exercise sciences, is the exercise side of it's been my main passion. And um, I started mainly as a swimmer. Um, and then the early mornings got a bit too much. And then I progressed into sort of like recreation running, I used to go running with my dad. Um, and then at university, I discovered aerobics and became an aerobics instructor and went on to become a personal trainer and circuits instructor, and also discovered outdoor pursuits. And um, at my university we had an outdoor pursuit centre and I spent most summers up in the Lake District learning how to windsurf and then teaching sailing kayaking and so on so it's quite a, a breadth of different um, sport and exercises that I've been involved in and continue to participate and so yeah so sometimes in, in some ways actually taking the my degree um, continued to introduce me to further sports and, and further options to work within the field of sport and exercise sciences. That's a really nice insight for the listeners to hear and that, that real breadth as I'm sure informs what you do on your everyday and has made you a sort of true advocate of, of sport and exercise and, and that wider piece of the sector. So in regards to this qualification, sport and exercise science, what, what, the, what does it actually mean for the listeners and viewers in terms of a standards verifier, a senior standards verifier and a chief examiner? Righty ho. So I'm, I'm obviously love the course and very pleased to hold both of those positions. So senior standards verifier, it means I'm overseeing the standards for the internal um, coursework. So all the internally assessed units, I work with a fantastic team of standards verifiers. We have annual training each year to make sure everybody's familiar with the standards and the sampling process. And what we do is we work with centres who are delivering on the sports and exercise science qualification. And we carry out sampling on an annual basis to make sure that the centres are meeting the standards that we set on an annual basis and the learner work is being marked and assessed accurately. Um, in terms of the chief examiner, we now have on the sport and exercise science qualification uh, external assessments, which are exams and task based external assessments. And my role there is to I work with, again, uh, an amazing team of principal examiners and examin uh, an examining team and uh, the principal examiners, they write the papers and my, my role is to support them and to make sure the papers are uh, appropriate, the questions are set, are fair and appropriate. And then we, we see once the questions have been taken or the exams have been set by students, I sit with the principal examiners setting the standards for marking. We do this on a series by series approach uh, and then we set the awarding and in terms of the, the gradings for each of the, the different series. So it's quite a varied role, um, both for internal assessment for senior standards verifier and then for external assessment on the um, for the chief examiner role. 
Great. And, and I think that that's a, a nice segue for us really to look at where this sits within our suite of qualifications, so more wider around BTEC. Um, so we have these qualifications with external assessment. Some centres may not be familiar with that and, and, and some will be very familiar. So that chief examiner role comes into play there. And for those people sort of viewing this and having a look, we've got a nice visual just showing our range of qualifications at level three, so equivalent to A-level, in which this qualification sits in, in its range of sizes. So it has those external assessments uh, for, for all the right reasons and covers it different content within the specification and the units than what our 2016 sport would, for example. Also within the specifications, we've got a page which really covers purposes. And what, why I really want to flag that is just to share with listeners and viewers around how they may choose to use this qualification in their given suite, whether it's how they already use it, maybe it's using it in a different way or introducing it into their curriculums. So I'm sure across the different practice and engagement with centres, you, you've seen this, Jenny, that some deliver the, the one A-level size all the way up to the three A-level equivalent. Is that something that gives different sort of application and uses to centres and learners? Is that something that you see and you hear much about? Absolutely. So we do find that the most common um, uptake is for the largest size qualification for the extended diploma. Um, so students will do a full time program, which is equivalent of A levels. And then with the progression route going on to university for some centres, it might be they have a, an A level offer they want to support learners with. And some learners might decide that they don't want to commit fully to a sport and exercise sciences qualification because they've got some A levels that they really enjoy. Um, it might be that they add biology or psychology or something like that, depending on the size that they take. Um, and then it gives uh, some more options for university progression so some students perhaps at the age of 16 to 18 aren't ready to commit to doing a degree within sport and exercise sciences so doing the smaller size courses alongside A levels continues to give them flexibility for their progression routes we often find that learners who've taken the extended diploma they've they've decided at the age of 16 that they really enjoy sport and exercise sciences and that's the route they want to continue um, on their journey when they go into university Great. And there's something around this speaking to practitioners in centres, often at the fact that it's got science in the title. Sometimes they talk about the levelness in the fact that, you know, anecdotally, they might say that it's harder. And it's important to make sure that we share with listeners that this isn't harder. It's not a different level, but it does obviously have that mathematical and scientific content, which sometimes in centres, they look at different entry for learners. Is that something that you've seen? Absolutely. So I do still work in a centre. I've actually taught, I've taught on this course since 1994 and seen a number of changes, as you can imagine, over okay. the years. And um, so currently um, we do have in my centre, we do request science and we do request um, a grade five for the sciences, either one, two sciences or um, across the board if they're doing the three sciences. So we do request that because there is, as you said, a, a heavy science requirement. The technical terminology that's required within science can sometimes be difficult if learners don't have quite a strong background within sciences so that's why obviously it has the name and the title it's sciences and, and learners need to be aware of that and we need to make sure we recruit appropriately to support learners to make sure the course is right for them in terms of they, they are able to progress and understand and achieve um, the qualification they've set out to undertake. Great so that piece around you know, setting the learners expectations at point of entry not setting them up to fail and ensuring that they've got those fundamentals for them to be able to thrive and, and develop on this qualification. I think there's also something here as well around the sport and exercise science that we do often see a larger uptake of learners progress onto HE within this area. And I think that's because it's got that science piece in the title and we're finding that HEIs, higher education institutions, are very receptive to that in the title and does, as you mentioned earlier, maybe more options for learners. Absolutely. So when we did, so I was involved actually on the qualification development for this 2016 qualification, we did work with HEIs and, and they did um, support the, the, the content that we've put in place. And they're very keen to obviously have elements that would support progression onto their university courses. So and, and we know if students do want to become a sport and exercise science scientists they do need to have a, a degree in order to progress into that particular sector so that's one of the reasons we do find many learners will progress onto university um, we know the course is appropriate for progression and we'll be getting a lot of feedback i know learners come back to me at my center and they feedback that the course they've gone on to at degree level has been 
they've really enjoyed it. They've not had any problems making the transition. Um, we are setting them up to be successful on degrees because we know that there's lots of similarities in terms of independent study. And there's also some content that is a similar standard. Although it's level three, there is not too much of a jump to go on to the undergraduate course. Um, so we have bridged that gap in a, in a very strong way with this particular course, whereas A-level students perhaps might struggle a little bit more because they don't have so much support with independent study with the research. And of course, the content may not fully cover aspects of the, the undergraduate degree where we know within our sports and exercise sciences programme, we have lots of units that do transfer very nicely onto undergraduate study. Great. And I think also in terms of curriculum design, you know, this is a STEM offer as well, which is often something that people don't necessarily look to the sports curriculum for. So that sport and exercise science piece does enable that for centres. OK, I, I think it's really nice to just share uh, maybe a bit of a look and feel of, of the breadth of some of the units. So you alluded to that just a moment ago about them being readied for that progression and the coverage of, of the scientific elements. But could you just give us a sense of the sort of things that are covered? Yeah, of course. So, so we've got the first two units and um, we've got exercise physiology and anatomy and it's the study of the body and how the body functions. So students will learn the, the basics of the body and then they'll learn how it applies to when taking part in sport and exercise and how the body responds and how it adapts to regular participation. Um, we then got exercise and um, sport and exercise psychology, which many students find very interesting because they can relate to it. It's how how your how you get ready for competition, how you respond, those nerves that kick in and how you can control those nerves and how you work in a team and many aspects that people can really relate to. And obviously, if you did want to become a, an exercise psychologist, it's something you need to be able to draw upon to support those clients that you're working with to help them with their sports performance. Um, those three units I've just discussed, they're all externally assessed. Um, and we do know that um, higher education institutes do like that form of assessment because it does build skills of revision and preparing for external assessment and being able to recall information um, which is necessary to help build for sector knowledge in the future. If you're working as a personal trainer, for example, then you need to know how which muscles are working when you're doing certain exercises. And that has to be something you've got embedded in, in your head. You can't sort of look at a book if you're working with clients. So some information that we do have has to be retained by the students and therefore having it assessed in exam conditions does help to build that retention in. We then have all the, the, the units that you see there that are um, not coloured in, that are coloured, uh, that are white, they, they're shown, they're internally assessed and we have a wide range here and lots of them are very practical based. So field and laboratory based fitness testing gives learners a lot of skills of working with clients and how to carry out fitness tests. Um, as you can see there, it's field based, but we also have laboratory based there and we do encourage centres. Many, luckily these days, do have sports and exercise science labs or they do make contacts with universities to use their labs for part of the unit. We've also got uh, Unit 5 Applied Research Methods, which does work very nicely um, with the research project Unit 9, where learners learn the skills to carry out research, and then they can carry out a project of their own to investigate a particular area of interest to them within the field of sport and exercise sciences. Other areas, we've got biomechanics, obviously that's one of the key features of sport and exercise sciences. It is an optional unit because we are aware that it can be um, difficult in some ways to get the, the equipment required to to deliver on this um, particular unit, but many centres that are delivering on this are finding they're really supporting learners to understand some quite difficult and technical terminology within the field of biomechanics. And we've also got coaching, um, so we know many learners may want to work within the field of coaching. Uh, so the coaching side of it is looking to improve performance and fitness, which are key areas which they progress to perhaps become a strength and conditioning coach after a degree or that sort of. So we're giving flavours for what it's like to work in the sector. Um, and also giving that knowledge and understanding to progress to university. Um, just to finish off this review, we've got sports massage. We know learners and many centres do enjoy that. So it gives a real taste for what it's like to do sports massage, the benefits. Many learners will enjoy the benefits of sports massage if they take part in sport themselves and, and see for themselves how it can help to prevent injuries. 
and then looking at unit 15 should um, a learner have injuries then they can learn how to address those but also look at what a sports in somebody who works in sports therapy how they can support clients who are injured how you assess them and how you can then support rehabilitation programs um, I did say last to finish but I do want to just briefly talk about nutrition so we've obviously got nutrition is so important within the field of sports and exercise sciences so we do have a, a module number 13 on that a unit which covers that side of things where you explore basics for nutrition but then you can then look and explore how you could support nutrition for different types of sports whether it's strength endurance or perhaps weight loss okay so quite a quick summary of all of them there's so many to talk about but I hope that gives a good flavor for, for what the content is for this particular qualification most definitely thank you Jenny I think you know some of the things for me thinking about that in terms of, of an offer in a center I think first of all the breadth and what that almost does for firstly that applicant before they come onto the course and the student therefore when they're on that course that it starts to open up doorways to to career routes in the sector that maybe they wouldn't have considered such as sports massage for example or sports injury starting to think about therapy in these different areas and nutrition as you've just touched on so I think that range is really powerful but it gives them a nice foundation in terms of this sector I like the piece around being able to apply a lot of these things. The coaching for performance and fitness isn't just about coaching. It's about putting all of those things that they've learned from the content, from the other specifications into practice through that lens of that very applied sense, but also developing those skills and behaviors as they would do in sports massage or biomechanics. But mentioning biomechanics, from my own experience going on to my university degree, if I hadn't had touched on or covered biomechanics at level three, it would have been even more daunting than it was uh, as an experience for me from my first, second to third year of university. And, and that then leads me into research, almost that, that mini type project of learning to research, uh, research sorry, and then doing a research project based around sport and exercise science Although obviously it's not the same level that a learner would do at their degree or, or masters if they continue down that academic route, starts to lay out some of those core foundations for them to be in a good place to do that. Is that something you've seen in your own teaching? Absolutely. So this really does help set up students for their, their work within university for their dissertation and it, it also supports them with their, their just general approach to carrying out research for other areas, of for other units of content they're studying in their degree. So it's building the skills of how to carry out a literature review, what sort of methodology you could use for carrying out some in investigations. And then the results, what sort of statistics would you need to carry out to, to make the results meaningful? And then what sort of inferences or conclusions can you make from that data? So it's really supporting learners to understand the process. And as you said, it's, it's giving an overview to start with. And then at university, they'll, they'll dive a little bit deeper into that. But they've already got a really good framework to, to use and, and have that knowledge to support them as they progress into higher education. No, thank you, Jenny. And I think just lastly, in terms of thinking about universities and university centres here, when we look at as a centre, I might be looking at lab based fitness testing and say, I really want the learners to do that, but maybe we haven't quite got all the equipment that we would need. I know that universities and university centres are very receptive to learner taster days, but building it around the content within the, the qualifications. Is that something you've seen or heard much about? Absolutely. And we totally recommend that. So it's a really lovely way for students to get to see what it's like in the university to explore some of the equipment and, and kit they have available. I know certainly in my centre, before we had any sort of sport and exercise science facilities, we would work with universities that we know many learners have progressed to. And they welcomed us and they're very keen to show off uh, what they had available. Uh, learners loved the days out that we'd spend there doing a VO2 max test. Occasionally they'd be really pushing themselves. And most people remember some sort of like nasty instances with a bucket when they've been pushing themselves really hard on the VO2 max and it's something they remember and they th it makes them think actually yeah this really is for me that's what I want to go to, to, to do so it's a lovely relationship if you can have that with the university near to you um, and you'd more likely be welcomed into to use it and explore the facilities. Yeah and that is a great one for practitioners to to explore. Okay, so really starting to think about the support for this qualification for, for people that are either watching or listening, they may have listened to the webinar with Penny Lewis, our subject advisor, where we covered a lot of these different elements. But I think in terms of the external assessment, it's worth calling out things such as uh, the examiner reports. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Jenny? 
Yeah, so this is something that um, all of the, the principal examiners, so whoever wrote the, the exam paper and who is leading on the marking of it will write a, a report at the end of each series. And what they do in this report is to provide an overview for what worked well uh, and what didn't work quite so well. So the, they'll talk about trends, some areas that students continue to have problems with. Maybe there's some misconceptions that learners continually seem to produce when they're responding to questions and that's highlighted in the report uh, alongside some learner responses and also where learners have performed really well and some learner responses are provided there. So in addition to that, we provide the marks the learner would receive um, in, for that particular response. So it gives you, the teacher, a really clear idea as to what's, what problems learners are having when they're facing certain questions and how you can action that and support them with revision prior to their exam series. Um, and also you can look at what, what you know, which questions got full marks and why did they get full marks to inform your teaching and to exhort, help learners with exam technique. So it's a really, really important document to read alongside the question paper and the mark scheme if you're a teacher who's delivering on the external assessments. Right, and, and I'm sure listeners are very familiar with, with the offer around authorised assignment briefs, uh, planning documents, past papers, etc. Um, so I, I think just, just on this slide here, really what I'd like to share with them for those not familiar with the external assessment is thinking about things like Exam Wizard and getting the fullest value from Exam Wizard. Could you maybe share why that's a useful tool in terms of external assessment? Yeah, so Exam Wizard, I, I've, I've been on it a few times um, just to familiarise myself with it. It's really, it's a lovely, lovely free tool. Um, what you do is it, for the exam based units, so units one and two, where there's a number of questions, what you'll find is you can search for a key area. So you might have been doing some work on perhaps on the heart, on the cardiovascular system. So you put in a keyword uh, such as um, heart, um, maybe cardiac cycle say you'd put that into your search in exam wizard and it will bring up all the questions that have been uh, set already in the exam series over the years and um, that relate to cardiac cycle so it'll bring you the question it'll bring you the mark scheme and also it'll bring you the lead exam report each on three separate tabs that you can easily navigate through to see how learners responded to that particular question any areas of concern you can then put the question paper together for your learners so you can customize a question paper arranged around the areas or the topics you want to assess them on sort of do some spot checks perhaps or you might have covered a part of a unit and you want to assess their knowledge on that so you can put together an exam paper based on previous questions in previous exam series and you've got all the the mark scheme and the lead exam reports to hand as well to support you and you're marking the papers and also to support learners perhaps if you want to give some revision prep prior to setting that particular exam. So it's well worth looking at that. You can save the exam papers that you make yourself so you can then use them again and again if you want to and they worked well with your learners. And do be aware we add to it. So after every exam series, we've got a fresh set of questions that are added to Exam Wizard. So it'll be continued to be um, refreshed after each exam series. Great. And, you know, watching that in some centres, how that's being used, whether it's developing exam technique for learners that maybe are not so familiar. So maybe each time they come in for a session, they just have that one question that you've pulled from Exam Wizard. Um, also, actually, if there's a real time opportunity that let's try a question, we're covering the content we're talking about, we're discussing it, we're learning it. Let's pull a question up. Let the learners undertake that, have that on the electronic whiteboard, and then maybe put the chief examiner report up for that part of the question and almost get them to peer assess so the learners can really start to get to grips with what that looks like and what the challenges are for them to be able to get the best outcomes for themselves and I think that just leads me on to result plus when the learners do undertake their live external assessments that centres are able to get individual cohort um, group results back against each of these exam papers and it drills down into topics so for me as a practitioner I can start seeing actually if there are certain themes within my given group where learners are doing really well or certain areas where maybe they're not doing so well and that might be around the teaching and learning it might be at the time of the year that I had it placed but it does really inform that reviewing of that process and it's a really powerful tool so they're just some things to think about in terms of external assessment I think what I'd like to share lastly, Jenny, before we move on and speak to Sean, is really thinking about 
maybe centers some last bits of advice if they were thinking about delivering this, whether it's centers or practitioners or even applicants, why is this a qualification which could bring value to them other than obviously all the things that we've covered so far? And um, I think it's certainly it's, it's a really enjoyable course to, to teach and, and learners obviously really enjoy it. And it's, as I said, it's been around for, for a very long time. It was one of the first courses in terms of um, the sport offer. Sport and exercise sciences used to be part of the applied sciences. And then as sport and exercise sciences grew, um, the number of job roles has increased. And therefore, we've, we've built the qualification to make sure we're supporting learners to have options to go into the variety of job roles. So in terms of the centres, centres need to make sure that ideally they have the equipment that we do state within the resources, because we do request in order for learners to have a really beneficial and, and proper experience on the course that they are given access to a range of materials and resources to give them that rich uh, experience of being and working within sports and exercise sciences and to be able to access the content. So it's making sure centres have either on-site facilities or they can access them with a perhaps a, a university or other providers and um, so they can use those facilities and resources. In terms of practitioners we do have some mandatory units so you need to make sure you have practitioner expertise across all of the mandatory units that you have to offer or that you'd like to um, in terms of the sizes of qualification you're offering at your centre. And then we do have a wide range of optional units, and that's where you can really pick a mix to suit the learners' needs in your local area. And also your pr practitioners you might have got, and certainly in my centre, we've got a very skilled sports massage therapist who comes and delivers on that particular unit. And then we also have very skilled um, people who work on the instructing um, exercise units. So you bring people in from um, who are actually in industry and they can bring their industry experience to the delivery and assessment processes and help support learners to get a real feel for what it's like working in industry in those particular roles. In terms of applicants, um, most, most learners will have, have done GCSE PE perhaps at school, or they might have done a BTEC level two. So they'll already have shown an interest in sports or PE. So ideally they'll have that as a, a standard approach. They know what they're letting themselves in for. And then ideally it's not compulsory, but it dep depends on the center, but they might have some sort of science background. Biology is obviously a very strong one with lots of crossover. Um, chemistry and physics show the ability to have knowledge of technical terminology. Um, so something along that lines would certainly support learners um, in terms of being able to understand the challenges and to be able to achieve on this particular course. That's brilliant. Just like to thank you for your time, Jenny. Um, and it's been really nice to sort of cover the sport and exercise science qualification with you. So thank you very much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very, very much, Gareth. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Sean Mullins uh, to this session on sport and exercise science. So obviously we've just spoken to Jenny and it feels a perfect time really to speak with someone that's in the centre. Um, so Sean, welcome to the webinar, Sporting Goals. How are you? I'm very well, thanks Gareth. How are you doing? Yeah, really well. It's great to have you here. And uh, just to share with sort of listeners or viewers that you're the curriculum team leader for sport at Bath College. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Great. Perfect. So on our sort of webinar, this one that we're, you're joining today is about the sport and exercise qualification specifically. We're really keen to get a practitioner's perspective, but not only as a delivery, you also sort of look after this qualification in your centre. Is that, that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. As part of the curriculum team in your role. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so just wanted to ask you a few questions really about the sport and exercise science course. Uh, I know you deliver it there and like I say, you look after that. Um, why do you offer it there? What, what are the attractions to offering that, this course? Well, I think anybody that looks at that what entails of being on this course uh, shows that it's a lot more advanced than what, what we offer otherwise on the level three program being the two the other that we offer is the sports coaching and development level level three which is the new 2019 specification and in comparison sport and exercise science um, really shows that some of the students that come on uh, might have a slightly higher academic ability but can also um, increase the, the the vast range of universities that they can go to um, so yeah not only is it different we just feel it has a little bit more appeal to those students that are slightly more academic and maybe feel that they're, they're not quite suited for, for A levels uh, and actually would like to go down the BTEC route, but also be recognised uh, as quite high academic achievers. Ach achievers. Great. And I, and I think that's a really nice point to make there. So just for clarity, obviously, it's a level three, so it's, it's equal in terms of level. 
but the fact that sport and exercise science has got that science within it, you, you mentioned maybe more options, that it becomes maybe more attractive to some sort of HEIs or HE courses, and it almost gives learners that additional option. And maybe, as you said there, considering A-levels, but no, actually, you know, I do want to do BTEC, but sport, in, sport and exercise science. Right. Okay, so in terms of, you, you may reference to academic level there. So do you do yes. something different with the entry requirements? Yeah, we do it something slightly different. So on our sports coaching and development level three, um, the entry requirements are four grade fours and above, including maths and English. Um, however, on our sport and exercise science level three, we ask for five. And preferably, we also ask for them to have uh, at least a grade four in science as well preferably not always um, and the reason we ask for that is because it is slightly more advanced it is slightly more difficult with the four exams that are, that are part of the process um, you know some of them are particularly difficult if you look at uh, sports psychology as an example um, can be quite daunting for some students so you know looking at it from that perspective we really want students to come in with uh, with the right mindset so yeah that's another reason as to why we we ask for for slightly higher grades but also uh, it's really important that we know the students are competent enough to deal with the demands that the, that the course comes with so knowing that they were able to pass um, English language particularly at a grade four um, including their maths yeah is, is really really helpful Great. So, you know, what I'm hearing there is obviously you don't want to set them up to fail. You want them exactly. to be able to sort of really engage with that and be ready for that external assessment. So though yeah. essentially not higher, it's that more scientific mathematical content that you would expect mm -hmm. on a science aspect based course. So those entry requirements reflect that. Perfect. OK, so does that then sort of resonate in the aspirations of maybe some of those learners on that course, where they want to go, what they want to do? Could you just give us a bit of a sense of that? Yeah, for sure. So we we get students go off on a range of directions, really. Um, we argue that, that sport and exercise science and actually evidence shows that uh, have a larger level of students that do apply for university coming off the back of the sport and exercise science course in comparison to the coaching and development level three. So yeah, there's a higher rate of students that apply to university, but significantly a lot of them that are interested in, in courses that involve um, physio pet therapy, as an example, they're the types of courses that the students would need to have their sport and exercise science uh, as a as a BTEC, as opposed to their sports coaching development for universities to accept them. So, yes, a lot of the time the students would rather come and do this course to have a, a stronger or a higher range of, of universities that will that will accept them, especially in those more science based courses. Great. Yeah. So that point there, obviously, uh, the coaching course that we're making comparison to or any other, I suppose, sports course at level three. This is very much, although you get your UCAS points, this has got that sort of science access. So it's going to enable mm -hmm. people to get into an institution that's asking for science uh, broadly. So are, are you seeing that in terms of maybe learners looking at doing an A-level alongside it or not? Is there a need for that? Are they going to places, obviously, your Bath College, you're across the road from Bath University. Mm -hmm. Are they able to access this sort of course? Yes, uh, I think universities have been have been quite good at adapting their their course entry requirements now, uh, and are actually a lot more accepting to sport and exercise science as a BTEC to what they used to be. Uh, in the past, uh, without the, the this new specification in play, sport and exercise science, they would have needed usually to have some type of science A level alongside it. For example, biology, um, if they were going to do a science based course at university. But looking at over the last couple of years, they've been a little bit, a lot more receptive to just changing that to having, a, you know, a specific higher grade, for example, a DDD up at Bath University. If they can get a triple distinction on a sport and exercise science course, then they'll be able to, to apply uh, and be accepted onto, onto the sport and exercise science degree up at Bath University. So it, it is nice that they're a lot more receptive to, to this new uh, structure of sport and exercise science BTEC. Great. Um, um, I've just been speaking to Jenny about that exact same thing. So it's really nice to hear that coming through. And again, although sports coaching or sports fitness or sports outdoor enabled progression onto maybe those HE pathways, maybe Bath mm -hmm. College in, in coaching, we're talking very specifically here about enabling them to access that sport and exercise science where often there is a higher demand and a higher entry requirement from those HEIs. Yeah. So in terms of the course, you made reference to the four external assessments if you're doing the largest version across those yeah. two years. Is there any advice that you'd, you'd give to practitioners looking at maybe planning this or delivering this qualification? Yeah, and you know, it's completely down to what people would, how they'd like to plan um, 
the program for themselves but we always looked at it in an angle of we wanted the students to sit both external exams um in the january sitting as opposed to the summer and the reason we've done that is simply so they have an opportunity to resit it again that in the summer so they get two opportunities to sit that exam every year what we wanted to try and avoid was having a student sit at the end of their second year and, and just missing the buck and actually off the back of that then not having the opportunity to, to complete uh, another sitting of that exam before they would go off to university um, but on top of that it, it gives us an opportunity from september until january to really focus on on that exam preparation and we did also include one coursework based unit in that time frame as well but predominantly the two exam based units up until up until christmas january after that of course is when they sit their exam and then the rest of the academic year is solely solely focused on coursework and practical assessments and for us that's worked really well really well um, the grades we've managed to, to achieve have been fantastic um, we had our first set of students complete this last year um, with 100 percent of them achieving a, achieving a grade of course a, a triple grade and then two of those students actually achieving triple d star um, which we are really really happy with uh, bearing in mind that you know the the situation that they had been in we were just really really impressed you know and off the back of that the, the first years last year although it was covid uh, covid times again the first year students of a larger larger sample group of 24 again uh, from looking at all the mock papers they did in january we felt they were more than ready for the exam um, so again just proving our point as to why we would give the advice to, to sit those january exams for the students and, and focus their time on that then yeah and that's that's really useful piece of insight and it's, uh, obviously we both appreciate that different centers will be within their own context and and take on board that information and think okay that works for us or that doesn't work for us but in terms of what you've shared there really about maximizing the opportunity for learners and i suppose from the very start that engagement and okay th this leveling up of these level three external assessments this is what it looks like this is what it feels like and almost i suppose setting those expectations for everyone involved yeah no totally agree Great. No, that's perfect. And you met, you mentioned the, the mocks there, so that the mock papers that we have, the, the samples and the exam wizard sort of support yeah. all of that, that wraparound. Great. Really pleased to hear that you're, you're accessing that and supporting the yeah, learners. Yeah, brilliant. The exam wizard itself, actually, for especially the units like physiology uh, and anatomy, it, it's really, really useful tool. Yeah, really good. Okay. Great. And, and we put a link in uh, the show notes for that because that's a really useful resource, as you've sort of reaffirmed there. Obviously, from the units, you've you've suggested some of those units that are quite a high science yield. Um, yeah. Of course, we appreciate the learners probably really enjoy the sports coaching that bring in together mm. of, of, of the theory into practice. Do, do you see that? Do you see that engagement through the sports coaching? Yes, definitely. Um, I think, again, if you're if you're looking at the way the students come in, they're predominantly, you know, prepare for an exam for that first for the first couple of couple of months so actually when you get out and do some practical both yeah in the gym for for your fit, specialized fitness training but also for the sports coaching for performance um especially the coaching performance unit for me that's that's where you really see the student students coming out of their shower and, and showing uh, the reason why they're on a sports course they all always thoroughly enjoy it and yes they are they're coming outside of their comfort zone um but actually yeah through our experience of running that unit they've all been absolutely fantastic even last year we were actually able to get out and assess them coaching although it was you know in a controlled environment because it had to be they were still all, all, all able to to really adapt their skills so it was yeah it was fantastic to see them doing that in such difficult times that's really positive to hear. I was going to ask about the research project. Often when I speak to centres around the research project, first of all, there's some trepidation, I suppose, in terms yes. of what that looks like. Mm. Uh, how, how has your centre's experience been of that and, and how valuable has that been for the learners? Yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult one because the students sometimes can be really new or, or maybe because there's such a large area and field that they can go into and because if you give them the right and range to be able to go out and do anything themselves it can be quite daunting for them um so it can you know for our experience take some time for students to really nail down what they want to do their research on um but actually when when it comes to terms of, of them actually finding their their niche or what they want to do it on they, they they've managed to again do do really really well um i think for us we we made it a, a year-long unit so that was really useful because it gave them that little bit of time um, 
to, to really focus on what they wanted to do and spend the time looking into it. There'll be some parts of the year that they'll have more time one week than others. And, and we set up regular meetings with their, with their lecturer to, to stay updated alongside some of their, some of their lessons. So yeah, it, it, our experience with it, with it has been, has been really positive. And, you know, on reflection uh, now running the second, second year, if that makes sense, um, we, we've gone down the route of doing it as a year long unit. Again, we've got some fantastic um, resources from last year and some fan fantastic projects from students that were, that were used last year that will, that will really benefit the students is coming into this year. But I think long term, um, it's really important for the students to learn how to read literature. Um, it can be it can be quite difficult for some students to absorb information from some key and relevant literature. So the opportunity to do that through research projects for us is, is really really important. Finalised by then being able to, to do this formally and put it into put it into references and reference lists before they then potentially head off to university uh, is is yeah an incredible tool that I wish I maybe would have would have had uh, on my list of units when I was at college before I then went off to university if i'm honest <laughs> yeah and, th and thank you for sharing that and i think you know that is a, that's a nice point in the sense that actually this unit is a bringing together quite synoptic in bringing together their learning from before at the, in that second year but really starting to ready and mold their understanding of of the structure and the expectations around that further research the breadth of what they're covering the depth uh, and also readying them uh, hopefully for that level six when they're doing their third year at university that degree so that's not totally new to them so yeah that's a, a really nice point something that's transferable in the academic world in terms of readying them that takes me on to a point i wanted to ask around the btec qualification that you offer that does it provide opportunities for transferable skills or is it just about learning sport and exercise science no absolutely um i think they're going to come in from school having very everything very structured uh, everything in place whereas when they come into college they might have free periods they might have elements that they need to come to the lesson take their notes go away put that into context come back share their ideas do the same thing again over a period of time especially with something like the research unit as an example um so you know it shows a, a high level of independence uh, that they'll need to um they'll need to show straight away as soon as they come in and it's important that they do that um you also think that there's there's going to be times that that be becomes quite difficult for them um you know managing managing the, the workload that has to come in being on time um all of those elements that, that are transferable into the real world of actually working again are just things that they're going to need to practice and um, definitely on on the sport and exercise science program I think in terms of some of the units that they cover and where that's going to be transferable um you know they potentially are going to be in real life scenarios where they would be dealing with a client. So if we look at, um, if we were to look at, let's go with fit, specialized fitness training, and they'll have to net naturally have what would be a client, they're going to gain the skills um, to what they would have to work with in, in the professional industry, if that's something they're looking to go to. So again, there's, we, we could, we could talk all day about the different units and everything that's in there. But for me, there's a, there's a vast range of opportunity for them to, to show a large level of independence, but also gain levels of communication or um, an organization to then go out on, into the working world. Yeah, nice. And that's a nice example, really. I think, you know, we think about sport, wellness, health, uh, performance, wh whatever that range of the sports industry and, you know, that people process, that that working with people is really critical. And that example that you gave there really magnifies an opportunity to work on those skills. Um, so I think what I'd like to ask you lastly, really, Sean, which would be really useful is if this is a course, and hopefully it is a course that you'd recommend to other centres, why would you recommend it to other centres to consider? Well, I just think as a, as a college, it gives you a, a larger breadth of students to target coming out of school. Uh, if you've got students that are definitely looking to go off to university, a lot of the time they're thinking that they do need to go off and do A-levels. Whereas having a sport and exercise science, if they are interested in sport, uh, gives them that extra um, extra opportunity to come to your college and study that the, the BTEC sport and exercise science with the opportunities that, that can come off the back of, of studying it in that course. I'd also recommend it because they're 
such a vast range of units that you cover over the two years. Um, for me, you're giving such a, a large amount of added value to each of those students, giving them the opportunity to, to recognize where they'd like to reach their full potential and, and in what criteria within sport. For example, you may have some student come away that's really, really interested in, in focusing their time into sports coaching, but then completely conversely to that, you may have an individual that would like to focus their time on going to study biomechanics. So that range of opportunities that, that you can offer students, um, you know, when they come to see you at an open day is, is something you can share with them and their parents, which would be, you know, hopefully a really useful tool to help recruit. Brilliant. That's really useful. Uh, really value your time uh, today, Sean. And um, I know you're in the mix of it with learners. So we wish you all the best for the rest of the academic year. And thank you for sharing that with colleagues. No problem at all. Thanks very much for your time, Gareth. OK, so I'd like to welcome uh, Sue Watson to the session today, who's the Professional Development and Partnership Manager at BASES. How are you doing, Sue? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Perfect. Yeah, really good. It's really nice to be able to speak to BASES today on this session, which is around sport and exercise science, so obviously very apt. And I think for the listeners and those, those viewing, it's really important for me to just to share um, sort of the purpose of this segment, if you like, really. Um, BTEC or BTEC Sport and Exercise Science has historically had a, a relationship with BASES, obviously because in terms of those learners on that course sort of populating and feeding the area in HE and HEIs around sport and exercise science. So I thought this is a really nice opportunity really firstly to kind of share that, that continued relationship and, and people would have seen in the newsletter that we had the message that we shared firstly around your infographic competition which we'll go on to later. Also around uh, the pride in which BASE is shared of, of being able to support this qualification and the value that it brings to the sector. Um, but I think really importantly, lots of people and practitioners and centres think about BASES as, as maybe something that they get involved with maybe in the last year of their degree or uh, when they're on their masters or their PhD. And I think something I'd like to bring to life for our listeners, both learners and practitioners and centres, is that there are some real benefits for them and their learners whilst they're, they're on their level three programme. And whether that's as a non-member or a member, and, we, and we'll talk about that moving forward, but I really just wanted to bring that to life and, and share that. That's fantastic. I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Perfect. So what, what I'll do is we, we move through some elements that we'd like to share. So I think, first of all, it's really important for us to sort of share that, that vision and mission of what BASES is. And I don't know if you could just bring that to life for the listeners. Yeah, so BASES, it stands for the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences, and it's the professional body for um, and the professional body and multidisciplinary association for sport and exercise science in the UK. So on the next slide, I think we've got the vision um, and the mission as well of BASES. So uh, BASES vision is to deliver excellence in sport and exercise science. And our mission is to lead the advancement of knowledge and evidence-based practice within the UK sport and exercise sciences for the benefit of human performance and health and education. So just on that, obviously, this has a whole sort of ream of benefits for the sector, the industry, and I suppose also academia as well. So we're thinking about sports performance, but I suppose health is a big part of that as well. Yes, it is. It is something that um, you, you generally forget because you obviously you see the word sport, but it's also exercise. So um, we do have, you know, a large number of practitioners and members that focus more on physical activity and exercise rather than just sort of elite sport as well. Obviously, we do cover that side too. OK, OK. And, and I think the, the next slide goes on and it, and it talks about divisions. And for me, just looking at that as face value, for those that are listening, we've got a number of different divisions. And straight away, it starts to break up, I suppose, the disciplines and, and get a sense of sport and exercise science, as you've just touched on, is is a whole plethora of things. It covers many things, not just that sport in peace. And I don't know if you could just share with us uh, what the divisions are uh, and why they're there. Yeah, so we, BASIS has five divisions uh, which contribute to the management of the association. So we have the Division of Biomechanics and Motor Behaviour, the Division of Physical Activity for Health, so we touched on that just previously, the Division of Physiology and Nutrition, the Division of Psychology and the Division of Sport and Performance. Okay, so I think some learners and lecturers will obviously the 
the units that they deliver on their on their BTEC, some of them will start to fall out of there or even the content of the specification that they cover. But obviously these, again, each of these divisions, I suppose, broke down into more specific areas again. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So if you take the division of psychology, so you, um, you can almost sort of split them in two. So you've got psychologists that work with sport and within sport and performance, but you've also got psychologists that work within a clinical setting or in a sort of more exercise based and look at exercise psychology. Um, so reasons why people might do exercise or might not do exercise compared to how people can use sports psychology to really get an edge within sport and elite performance. So, um, yeah, they do break down within those sections as well. So, um, yes, definitely a very, very broad area. Right. And I think what that leads into really nicely is particularly with learners, if we're thinking about level three, almost that sense of what career pathways are there for me? What, what are the jobs in the industry? Um, or, or also, where can I go further in terms of my academic journey to be able to find out more and, and access many of those opportunities in the future? So those pathways, those units that they might resonate with BTEC, going into divisions and then linking into, I know you have a, a guide for careers in sport and exercise science. Be really interesting if you could share with us what that's about and how that may benefit centres and learners. Yeah, so we developed um, the, the career guide to sort of help people um, investigate the world of sport and exercise science as a career a little bit more. Um, so the career opportunities within sport and exercise science um, are huge and they're expanding all the time. There's so many different roles from applied roles such as um, sports biomechanists, working with elite athletes to university lecturers or researchers or even clinical cardiac physiologists working within a hospital. So it, the, the depth of the, of the industry is massive. Um, so with, within our careers guide, we do actually, um, it's a 52 page guide and we do actually break down, there's 16 job profiles um, that help to sort of demonstrate different roles that people could look at. And obviously there's a lot more than that. So um, members can actually access those job profiles and have a look at them. And also within the careers guide, there is um, pathways to help people um, find their way through to their career that they want to do, sort of detailing the degrees that they might need to look at or masters or PhDs. And, and the route that they need to take to achieve that career as well. So we do have two versions of the career guide. We've got a version that is a non-member version, um, and that's a, a shorter version. The members version shows the 16 job profiles as well. Um, so hopefully um, students might find that helpful when they're thinking about a career in sport and exercise sciences to understand what's out there really, and also help them with finding their way to the job that they would like. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, the, the second bullet point that where you run through a number of roles there just really started to demonstrate the breadth uh, and, you know, the value of this sector and sport and exercise science and in turn sort of bases and, and bring into life those career guides. And I think it's important that there is the membership piece, but also that's that piece where your level three is just introducing them to it. They can access this. And I think thinking pastorally from a, a a lecturer position or a teacher position just being able to go through those career maps for people to start to plot and, and really start to think about where they can go next in terms of them, their mobility their progression their articulation and also might be a nice thing around UCAS time really start to break down what courses do I want to go on to what does that enable in the future and I suppose also at the start of induction for level three maybe also aspirations of where I can go with with this career journey this academic pathway definitely and also the, within that guide there is a, a map as well um including so universities are quite heavily involved in the career guide as well so it does sort of give a bit more idea of where to go next as well so that that's a good thing about the careers guide Right. And I think uh, what this this next piece demonstrates, it talks about increased knowledge and skills. Uh, and again, there's there's a piece there that lays out what, what, that the members can access, but also non-members. So if you're introducing this to some of your learners at level three that are kind of just thinking, OK, well, what can I gain from the website and going on and having a look around and having an explore that there's actually I understand webinars that they they can access. Is that right? Yeah, um, so we deliver, last year I think we were delivered um, nearly 30 webinars, so it was there was quite a lot going on last year and obviously with um, 
things that were going on. So um, the webinars um, are free to members, but they also, for a small fee, non-members can access them. So for five pounds, uh, a non-member can join a webinar. And these webinars are delivered by experts from all over the world on many different top topics. So from all the different divisions as well. So you can actually view um, the up and coming webinars on our website by accessing the events page. And we also run um, workshops as well, um, which, which are a little bit more expensive, but and a bit more in depth. So it might be a good idea to start with the webinars first. And then there's members can access division events. Um, and then there's also an online members area where the recordings of the webinars can be accessed as well. So even if you're a non-member, you can actually gain access to the webinars for a small fee. And um, they might be, if you have a look at the events page, they might be covering certain topics that are in modules at the moment or expand on topics that they're looking at as well throughout their curriculum. Great. Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. And, and the fact that you can just look it on the website, I think from a practitioner's perspective, lead, leading a unit, it might be that actually I'd, I'd go and try one of these and, and see where it's pitched and actually maybe start to differentiate my learners and the learners that are at the, the level that can be stretched and challenged, maybe looking at that higher order criteria, or maybe even those learners that are thinking about very specific things in their project in year two in their BTEC as well and saying, okay, well, that one's really going to give me some real value uh, for that small fee to support them. And also starts getting them to think about those questions, the way that things are delivered in readiment for HE as well. So I think, you know, there's a number of uh, benefits from maybe starting to look at that in year two of their program because they would be much more ready for those so no that's really great to share that and i think what that also then links to is this enhancement of employability so obviously you've got a slide here around that and the different bits that are offered um but i i think people we're going back to the career map we're going back to what choice they're making for ucas and the course in which they access how how would bases benefit a learner thinking about their employability yeah uh, we uh, we advertise job vacancies, so a lot of universities and employers come to us um, to advertise their jobs, so anybody can view those uh, within the website as well. And there's also studentships as well that go up there, um, so uh, if you wanted a bit more direction with your studies and uh, there might be something that sparks a bit of interest or uh, motivation to, to have a look at um, for students there as well. And also to see, you could also see the sort of salaries that they might be looking at as well, um, you know, with the, the sort of end goal of their career. <clears throat> Members um, get a, a newsletter, um, including all the studentships and, and uh, job vacancies as well. But like I say, non-members can actually view them on the website uh, without having to log in. So uh, that is something that they, they can access. And obviously we've mentioned the career guide as well. Um, so we do have obviously uh, networks for members as well that include uh, closed Facebook groups and Slack groups and networking events as well. But that might be something that maybe the, the, the deliverers might want to have a look at or even okay. the students might want to um, get involved in. And we also uh, offer awards, grants and scholarships. So um, to be involved with BASIS might actually support somebody's academic career because um, they can apply for um, grants to do research um, or scholarships and um, receive financial awards as well. So that's something that that could actually help um, with studies and research as you go, as they go along their career pathways. Yeah, I think that's really useful. There's a couple of things that come to mind there for me. I think, yes, some, some people might be listening and think, okay, well, that's that's not for my level threes. But I think actually in terms of the salaries, that informs the next steps. Okay, is this the right sort of direction for me? Yes, I want to be fully invested, but is that the sort of salary and lifestyle I'm looking to have? Um, and then also I think around some of those studentships, maybe they start to become some of the questions they're asking some of their HEIs when they're speaking to them about their courses. Have you had learners that are on studentships um, what sort of things have they been doing etc so I think it really starts to inform the questions that they could ask as well um, what I'd like to share is something that we put out to our customers our centers that are with us just prior to the summer but I think this is a probably a nice time to share it around the basis infographic competition moving into the October half term um, maybe an opportunity to introduce learners to bases that are on their level three programs. I don't know if you could just tell us a little bit about your infographic competition. 
Yeah, we're really excited about actually to be able to work because obviously predominantly we do work with uh, HEIs and it's really nice to have something for level three students. And so uh, there's been a, a little competition developed uh, for level three students and further education within the UK who are studying sports science or physical education. Students are to design their own infographic about how one of the sports sciences biomechanics, physiology or psychology can improve human performance. And there's lots of prizes. So the first prize is support by Human Kinetics, um, who uh, publish books related to sport and exercise science. Um, that's a £100 book voucher and one year student membership. Second prize is, uh, again, supported by Human Kinetics and a £50 book voucher plus a one year student membership. And then third prize is a one year's basic student membership. So it's really exciting. And the deadline is actually the 13th of December. So it might be something that students want to consider that could maybe even be a piece of work or a project within their studies already that they could have a look at and investigate and design. Um, and it might be a chance to explore their sort of preferred discipline a little bit more um, and have a look into it. So we're really excited to be to be um, uh, releasing this competition and, and uh, working with the students on that. Yeah, and we're really pleased to be able to share it with, it, with our centres. And, and I think one of the things that you shared there actually getting them to think about maybe presenting in a certain way, you know, around infographics, maybe that informs some of their future study, but also importantly, this is going to arm them and equip them for the rest of their course as well, but also fulfilling that piece of bases and for them to sort of start to explore further the benefits of bases and having a real understanding of that and what it can do for them and their journey. I know in terms of benefits here, we've got a number of benefits and it might be really nice if you pull out some of the headlines. I'm thinking that, this isn't just for learners, that this may be really useful for those lecturers that are delivering the spot and exercise science course as well in, in their centres? Yes, definitely. Um, so I think it'd be really beneficial for both students and deliverers um, because we do have a really vibrant community of really um, highly qualified and expert, expert um, practitioners um, within bases and they do contribute to newsletters and events um, and we publish latest research as well so um, if uh, deliverers are looking to update their um, lesson content or um, you know find ideas of exploring different topics then that might actually be useful for deliverers as well as um, students to have a look at. Um, being a member can also, we've talked about the careers guide and vacancies and studentships and awards, etc. So enhance employability and help to progress your career as well. Basis is a community. So once uh, somebody joins that as well, it helps to network with other practitioners and employers um, within the industry as well. And it can help to increase knowledge and skills. So we talked about webinars and workshops and access to those. Um, and, and that can help develop skills as well. Um, so you can register for members only events and we have a big conference as well. Uh, there's the basis conference, which is in November. And then uh, we've got the student conference as well, but I'll touch on that a little bit more um, in, in a, bit, a little bit later. Um, you can also save money on books, courses and events. And the members area is full of valuable resources. So not only we've got the recordings of all the webinars that we've done, for the past couple of years that are already up there so as soon as you become a member you can access all of that knowledge um, and those uh, learning tools that could be used for lessons or could be used for research for a student as well um, and all sorts of uh, there's the expert statements that that go up there as well and other pieces of research that are put up um, and then you get to be a part of the largest sport and exercise science science network within the UK as well so there's lots of benefits to becoming a member of BASES. Massively thank you. Um, I, know, I know one of the the things that you shared there is around essentially the, the magazine and, and that's something that I know historically working in centre was something really nice to, to have in the LRC as well for learners to be able to access that and and I think for me as a practitioner reading the documents making sure you stay up to speed with what's happening as well it's it's really nice and, and sort of bite-sized you know it's not a journal it's not meant to be and I think that's one of the benefits for me in terms of being able to get some of that information across to learners particularly at level three in the first instance. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of our most popular mem member benefits as well. So thanks for bringing that one that one up. So it's um, uh, uh, all our members receive the basis quarterly magazine, which is called the Sport and Exercise Scientist. Um, it contains the latest industry industry news, uh, basis expert statements, cutting edge research. Uh, book and app reviews as well that can be very useful when doing research and interviews with experts as well so it's got a lot of things in there but as you say it, it's quite easy an easy read as well it's it's not necessarily um filled with uh complicated language and things like that so it's, it's actually really a um, nice uh, magazine to receive through the post as well as you can access it online yeah, definitely really accessible. And, and I think one of the things for me thinking about that BTEC journey, when learners are starting to think about maybe what they'd like their project to be, their research, um, that this is something that starts to maybe introduce some ideas in a, in a way that is, is a, an appropriate level, an appropriate language, uh, and gets them to think about something maybe outside their immediate sphere. So yeah, a really nice research, particularly um, linking it to that BTEC journey as well, it works nicely. Um, I think on the next slide, we, we mentioned the student conference. And again, this is something that would be for HE learners, but I think it's something that would be quite nice for learners leaving level three to understand that they could maybe access that as soon as they go into their, their HE journey, as opposed to wait until later on in, in that experience. Yeah, so uh, the basic student conference is, is hugely popular um, and it is a members only uh, event. It's going to be held at the University of Huddersfield next year. Um, and the theme is supporting the next generation of, of sport and exercise um, scientists. So it, it really sort of does target um, the, the audience that we're, that we're talking about, the students um, that are looking to go into sport and exercise science. Um, so, so, so it's a two day conference um, with presentation and lectures, forums and workshops. And students can actually submit abstracts and win awards as well within that um, the conference. So it could actually be a financial um, benefit to students as well if they did um, submit something and, and potentially win an award as well. Um, and uh, we do have world leading experts delivering at this com com conference um, and invited speakers as well. Uh, if you want to receive any more information about this student conference, you can access it via our website. Great. And, and from my own experience, actually, I, I really like the, the fact that it moves around to different institutions each time that it happens. I think it's really nice to see different institutions and meet different learners and the fact that the theme changes as well. Um, personally, took a lot of value from, from the student conference and, and really, really nicely done. The next slide we, we touch on uh, for listeners in terms of the professional development. And in truth, this is about horizon gazing and thinking more about that MSc journey and beyond. But I think what it does is start to make people think about some of those longer journey benefits in terms of academia and then in turn that career. I don't know if you just want to pull out a couple of, of key bits there, Sue. Yeah, so uh, when we're talking about professional development, we are looking at sort of industry standards. So we do work with a wide um, range of employers such as the English Institute of Sport, the Scottish Institute of Sport, Scotland Institute of Sport, the English Premier League. And we um, and they do support our accreditation. So when they're advertising jobs, they are looking for um, practitioners that have um, accreditation uh, from bases. So we do bases uh, direct accreditation, supervised experience, which is a route to getting bases accreditation, which uh, is a more supported route. Um, we, and our accredited practitioners can actually also apply to be chartered scientists as well. And we offer for our more experienced practitioners the high performance sport accreditation. For people looking at the, the sports psychology route and wanting to become a sports psychologist, which is actually a protected title um, by the uh, HCPC, we've got the sport and exercise psychology accreditation or the SEPAR route as well, which is a fairly new um, accreditation route that's been developed. So if somebody's looking to sports psychology, it may be worth having a look into that in the future. And then we also um, have the certified exercise practitioner as well. So like, as you said, I think it is, it's, it's future gazing for people, but I think um, it's something to look at and sort of plan out 
if somebody did want a career as um within elite sport or with with any of the disciplines it is something worth looking into sort of now to plan out your route and how you might achieve that Brilliant. Yeah. And that's a really nice point. I think in terms of, as you say, that sort of career mapping, which was something we touched on earlier with that guide, that actually when when we're asking the questions of our HV provision or looking at our range of options, is this something within that institution or is that course going to enable me to to take that pathway in terms of being an accredited sport and exercise psychologist, for example. So again, they're questions that can start to be asked and thought about, which I think is obviously really relevant for what we wanted to do here today. So I think that was all the information that we were going to share today, Sue. And I, and I think really importantly, one of the first things I wanted to get for, for our listeners and watchers was around their awareness of bases and hopefully there's enough here for them to really be able to we've shown them the door and they can come and explore further with your website I would say yeah we look forward to to being in touch with them hopefully they'll come and explore see what's there and um and really use the, the knowledge that's out there and the network as well and and perhaps bear bases in mind along their career pathway brilliant so I'd like to thank you for your time uh, and it's been great to talk to you Thank you. Thanks, Sue. So Sue has left with us the student membership uh, fees that, that are applied by BASES, and there's a email address there if people want to go and find out some more around membership with BASES um, with a rate there for BTEC centres. I think anecdotally from myself, actually, as a head of department, something that was really useful a really useful membership for staff delivering this and at level three i think critically not necessarily memberships although memberships if you have capacity would be great for learners but the, just introducing them to the website and understanding what basis is about is really valuable particularly those on sport and exercise science but also this transcends to those on sport as well because their journey may delve or divert into sport and exercise science as they move forward so it's been great on this episode to be able to speak to Jenny, Sean and Sue. And again, if there's something that you'd like to know more about in regards to our BTEC provision, uh, the information's there to contact our subject advisor, Penny Lewis, and some other email addresses and links that may be of value. Uh, if you're listening, you can just type into Google uh, Pearson subject advisors and you can find the drop down for PE and sport which is Penny Lewis, as I mentioned, and also our BTEC Sport landing page. We'd also love to hear any feedback on these webinar series. Is there anything you'd like us to cover or explore further, whether that's in this series or future ones to come? If not, thank you for listening or watching, and we look forward to inviting you to our next one. Bye now.